Thanks for having me. Um, I just showed up. I, I apparently I'm at the furthest place away from where I was in San Francisco to get here. So I thought I was about to jump in the drink and swim to Alcatraz to get to this meeting. <clears throat> so my name is Gabe Gotzi. I am the Chief Innovation Officer for the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources. And I'm going to describe to you just a little bit about who that is, what we do, um, talk a little bit about California. But before I do that, I want to start with just giving you a little more information about California itself. Um, yeah, I understand many of you are not from California, so I thought that even if you are, and you're from Silicon Valley, it might be that you don't maybe know some of these things that I'll, I'll be talking about. So first up, California is the agricultural powerhouse of the United States. It is the number one ag producing, um, food producing state in the United States. Um, uh, largest population, largest food producer, and has been for a number of years. So about 50 billion in raw farm gate output from uh, in food and ag in California. That translates into over 300 billion uh, in value added food processing and, and a variety of other things that come across through the working landscapes. Um, the next closest state is Iowa, um, maybe about half the, the actual ag production um, in Midwest. You can see there from the bar chart at the top. But there's some things, you know, some of the, the crops you might not, so it might surprise you. Uh, believe it or not, Wisconsin is not the largest milk producer in the United States. It's actually California uh, by quite a lot. And then uh, all the specialty crops, the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, um, were generally one of either the or close to the leading producer of those in the United States, if not the world. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of California agriculture. So you see here just a map of the United States, um, about 2,500 miles across from, from here all the way over to, say, New York, Maryland. Um, just to give you a sense, these are just two crops. Um, one of my colleagues said that at UCNR did this. But there's 1.3 million acres uh, of almonds in California, or about, if you counted all the row miles, each row, 495,000 row miles. So that, for just to give you a sense of it, 192 rows across across the United, entire United States one time. So uh, a massive amount of almonds are uh, produced in California. 192 rows across across the entire States. Grapes, even more. Now grapes uh, vineyards are narrower. Uh, that's 829,000 or 852 row miles. Um, and so 331 rows of grapes across the United States um, are grown in California, just by uh, way of getting a sense of California ag. That, that list goes on. These are the biggest, but other crops are more similar. Um, but that all depends on water. Uh, we've had a lot of water this year. You probably heard a lot about California's uh, rain and snow, and it's, it's been, a, frankly, a surprise to us uh, in California. But we don't expect the trend to last. Um, uh, California, California's water is um, mainly dumped on the Sierra um, Nevada mountains, which you can see a picture of there on, the, on your left. Uh, so it mainly falls on the north, particularly the mountains. It is uh, contained in the, the, the water battery, which is the snowpack. Um, that then melts, and it is then uh, either stored or uh, conveyed through um, a very complicated and politically uh, intricate water conveyance network. You can see that picture, uh, the California aqueduct there, um, just underneath the Sierra Mountains. That's a statewide aqueduct. It's like a main artery across the state that even goes up and over the grapevine um, from Central Valley into the Los Angeles area. You can see some pipes there that convey that up and over the hill. It's a massive, massive infrastructure. Um, then on the far right, that's actually in the Imperial Valley, California, on the border of Mexico, where there's a canal system that goes into irrigation districts uh, that's allocated uh, uh, across the state. So very, very um, important system that allows California to be what it is. That's a precious commodity. Um, and it's a big challenge because we have less of it, we have more demand for it, uh, etc. And then our workforce. Um, the, uh, we, we've had crop production in California since the 1850s. 
Uh, it looks very, very different um, today than it did in the 1850s. Uh, but California started to take shape as a specialty crop leader in the early 1900s. Um, we uh, had a workforce from all over the world, uh, Chinese, uh, Sikh, Filipino, uh, Latin American workers um, from all over the world. Um, we greatly increased the presence of particularly Mexican workers in the Macero program in the early 1900s. Uh, and then uh, over time, uh, the, those programs changed into the H1 and H, H2A uh, programs. Um, but what's interesting it, uh, is that really, if you look at the workforce 100 years ago, these pictures are from 50 and 90 years ago in some cases, it looks actually quite the same. Uh, the, the California uh, agricultural landscape might have changed a little bit, but California actually employs about 90% of the, the ag labor workforce in the United States. So it's a big challenge um, that it's shifting constantly. Uh, I probably don't need to describe to this crowd you know, the, the challenges with uh, the, the issues of immigration and um, California agriculture is caught in the middle of this, this issue. And so, so really addressing the workforce is a key priority for the food system in California. Um, and California, as I mentioned, is central to food security, top, you know, top labor supply, top food supply. Um, we have a very unique climate. We have small and mid-sized farms um, and, uh, and large farms here in California. There's a big focus on organic farming, climate smart agriculture is a big priority, and very specialized industry, the top tier industry in food universities. Um, but as I mentioned, it's threatened. We have a thousand year old drought due to climate change. Uh, water, wildfires are a huge issue in California. We have shrinking amount of farmland, and it's very expensive land compared to other places in the US and uh, in adjacent countries. Um, our small farms are very difficult to start and profit from. Um, as I mentioned, we have a shrinking workforce. Homers um, are always dealing with uh, influxes of pests and diseases, and uh, soils are becoming less and less productive. So, but at the same time, California Dad has an emerging platform for climate smart agri food technology. That's on the ag side, on the food side, and on the circular um, economy, bioeconomy side. There's new solutions that we're developing here in California uh, in artificial intelligence, cloud computing, robotics, genomics, uh, biotech. And um, we're really taking the, the approach of linking the areas like the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, San Diego, Los Angeles, to our food valleys. And so we're linking up the ecosystems of food production with tech production. Uh, we've got the world's top ag and food universities. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. Where we're actually innovating on how we do technology transfer in agri-food and climate technology. Um, we're also including small farmers, farm workers, food producers in the process. So they are at the table through all the technology development and inclusive innovation approaches that we're taking. There's critical testing and validation of technology if you're risking in the market happening. We really see California as this platform for innovation uh, for the future of climate smart ag and food production. Um, the University of California has been doing this for over 100 years. Um, and so we have pictures of our people going back from the early 1900s. Um, we have boots on the ground people across the state of California um, through our agriculture and natural resources group, which I'll describe shortly here. So this is a little bit of a picture of the University of California system. So there's about 230,000 students uh, and 280, excuse me, 200,000 faculty and staff, 280,000 students, 2 million alumni across our 10 university campuses, our three national laboratories, and our five medical centers in California, including one in San Francisco. Um, we're also the, one of the top um, innovators in the world. We produce far more patents than Harvard, Stanford, MIT, um, <clears throat> etc. And we have a very vibrant and big ecosystem of startups, 8 billion in research funding. And then we've got our statewide agriculture and natural resources network, where we have nine field research centers that really cover every um, biome of California. We've got research projects and field offices across the California. So we're really boots on the ground uh, 
beyond the campuses in every community. So just as a, this is one example of how the University of California has really partnered with the ag and food industry over the years. And so hopefully this is easy enough to read. But the, back in 1905, we established a citrus research station in Riverside, California, down south. Um, as time went on, we really helped grow that industry significantly from 10,000 acres to today, where it's up near 50,000 acres of mandarins, specifically mandarin orchards. Partly we did that by developing the Tango Mandarin. You might know that as cuties or halos, um, a product that we actually patented um, back in the early 2000s. That has since, you know, made that acreage explode. Um, and that's also happened in other areas of citrus as well. On the flip side, there is a crippling disease in the citrus industry that is taking it out of its knees, frankly, starting in Florida, and that is called Wang Wang Bing, walked by a bug called the Asian citrus psyllid, which basically causes citrus trees to, to uh, die over time through citrus greening. So um, we are working hard on that. We developed, we early detected it. We've since tried to keep it out of California. Um, we've done a reasonably good job of that. Um, of, but now we're looking at new production methods and even new biotech products, biological products, to actually fight uh, one little pain. And so we're actually working with the industry um, to both help grow it and help protect it um, and save it from this very devastating disease. Um, in addition, with other crops too, we're looking for automated citrus orchards. We're working on that pro project as well as uh, new production methods to, to uh, figure out how to uh, address the, the disease issues in, in HLB. Um, and we really think, thinking about innovation, how we're approaching it going forward, the future is circular. I mean, we're really thinking about circular and everything we do and how we think. Um, with these enabling technologies of artificial intelligence, by like omics technologies that are driving innovation, we're really thinking circularly about how um, sustainable new crops um, drive new ingredient and food markets, um, how those turn into fresh and pro uh, prepared food products that, that really help health outcomes and drive less waste. So everything we do and how we, we think about innovation going forward is all about circularity in ag, food, health, and climate. And food is going, is really uh, undergoing a revolution. I mean, just to, to, by way of summary here, I'm going to credit the March Fund with this, with this but uh, I use it a lot. We, we achieved ba basic food safety and industrial, industrialization in the 19th century. In the 20th century, it was all about globalization of brands, um, basic nutrition, shelf life extension, and we achieved calorie security. We, we have enough calories. But then we, uh, we innovated the nutrition out of the food as well. So really, the, the next generation here is back to precision nutrition, foods for health, safe and clean food ingredients, um, supply chain integrity and traceability, um, sustainable production, and then nutritional security while decreasing waste. Uh, this was uh, highlighted recently, uh, last fall, by the Biden administration, who uh, designated the food supply chain as critical infrastructure that's mainly uh, operated by the private sector. And so uh, the Biden administration has taken serious note of our food uh, supply chain and has mobilized uh, a lot of new funding and a lot of um, directives to its federal agencies, even ones outside of the traditional ones you think about for food bag to strengthen both the cybersecurity and the food security um, of the, the food infrastructure in the United States. So we uh, at the University of California developed an, uh, a new approach to working that really uh, works between academia, government, and industry, but also supports not just research, not just teaching, not even public service and what we call extension, but really to support the identification, commercialization, and um, scaling of science and technology breakthroughs, whether they come from the University of California or whether they come from anywhere in the world. Um, we want to both invent them, help validate them, and scale them in California and to the rest of the world as well. 
So we really see our place in the market here is bridging the gap between the research and uh, academic environment on the left-hand side and commercial uh, business on the right-hand side by really helping try to bridge that valley of death in various ways. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing that. Um, we don't do it alone. We really work with a network of people across the California. Like I said, we focused on our food production regions in California. A lot of them have nascent um, innovation capabilities, um, whether that's fields or technology, proof grounds, um, or food production pilot um, plants. A lot of different kinds of assets that people have around California. Really, our starting goal is to connect a lot of these assets together um, to amplify their work, um, to uh, advance some of the technology growth. So I'll talk a little bit more about those things as well. Um, and we're really, as far as technology goes, I mean, it's a broad spectrum of things. I won't say we're really honed in on any one thing, except we really see this intersection between digital, mechanical, and biological, and uh, various permutations of that. And that's typically in that vein of technology. And you can't really read it here, but. Um, there's a lot of examples of different types of technology, whether it's farming, whether it's novel food products or ingredients, whether it's um, actually health applications. Um, there's, there's things going on across the EC system and in our portfolio of projects. Um, we really, again, thinking circularly, um, we looked, we're looking at gaps in the production of food. Um, from things like labor automation, digital agriculture, and uh, lowering the resource footprint of producing food, um, to switching from chemical, chemical to biological applications. There's a, a California is the most highly regulated uh, state in the United States, much like so it's more and more in Europe than any place in the U.S. is, and so it's a naturally there's less less farmers would call tools to deal with major pests, and so there's a very big push right now to transition to biological applications. Um, and that, of course, is also leading to a large bioeconomy that's, of course, taking place in the, here in the Bay Area around food technology, materials, um, climate technologies as well, um, and all of that's in sort of a, a mix. Um, leading also to food ingredients and uh, food safety and ingredient transition, um, upcycling, and we're doing some really interesting um, using of coke side streams and coke products that come off of ag operations, either into food products or into energy solutions, etc. Um, obviously, working leading to new solutions and integrating worker and community health at the same time. Just a couple of examples of some of the target technologies we're working on right now. Uh, various ag and food robotics automation, uh, dairy, sustainable dairy technologies, uh, controlled environment agriculture is a theme, um, various food processing um, applications, bioproducts and materials, um, digital agriculture, and artificial intelligence. Uh, we, we, as I mentioned, we have a, uh, we, we have a process where we can connect and navigate really California innovation, so um, you know, happy to help anyone in this room navigate uh, any of the, the ecosystem we have across California to support commercialization of technology, economic development, research and development across our colleges, universities, government entities like NASA, etc. Um, we also build global collaboration, so um, we've got a, um, I'll just, just skip right past the, the wordy slides, we've got as an example, in a, a, collaboration with the Netherlands, um, where I'm headed tomorrow, to focus on sustainable dairy innovation between Wageningen University and a number of the, the, the farming and tech sector in Europe. Um, where we focused first on identifying what the actual industry challenges are and went through a process to move from industry identified challenge into salute global innovation scan and then working to create um, non equity uh, de risking projects um, here in California to support uh, advancing technology. So, uh, just to show like just a little bit of a you know, some logo snoop here. We did a dairy innovation assessment across manure management, methane, tariff methane, you know, standards of measurement and labor, looking at the, the landscape of technologies out there. And we're actually going to be working with several of them to validate and de risk that technology here in California in the coming six months. We did the same thing with, uh, with controlled environment agriculture. 
Um, we have a fair number of controlled environment ag in California, both greenhouse production and vertical farming, companies like Plenty. Um, so we have some natural expertise here, but we really need to leapfrog where this technology is today. And so we're working again with the Netherlands on this particular sector to advance the crops, the cost structure, the capital, um, to advance the, the, the ecosystem for CEA. And uh, again, large number of partners in both the, the legacy farming and tech sectors in that space, but also our university partners as well. Um, and again, simpler process, we identified the key challenges and we're trying to tackle those in a, in a, in a systematic way. Um, we also work on the R&D side um, with um, foundational technologies. So uh, we were part of a foundational, um, National Science Foundation grant for advancing the use of artificial intelligence in the next generation food system that's led by UC Davis, but Berkeley, Cornell, Illinois, you know, we're all involved in this process. And we're working on various problems from molecular breeding, um, all the way up through human health and nutrition, and we're looking for, for challenges to work on collaboratively with industry uh, from the uh, APHIS group, it's called. Um, and then we can continue to grow innovation capacity in California as well. So um, just by way of example, we have a large initiative in the Central Valley to grow innovation capacity there, called F3. So uh, engineering for ag is the tagline, and we're working on all kinds of machinery applications, precision ag applications, small farm applications uh, there. We have partnered with Western Growers to put on an, uh, an ag robotics and automation summit. We did a very successful one last year in Fresno. We're doing another one here in Salinas. So if any of you are interested, uh, most of the ag robotics companies in the US are showing up to this event and the large equipment manufacturers. So we're trying to do things like this. We're doing a biological summit uh, next, uh, this later this month in Salinas as well. And then uh, last but not least, um, we're really trying to increase the capacity to support deep tech science and technology innovation in California. So we're working on projects like the plant. That project is based near UC Davis, where we're uh, building out space, including it's an innovation center meant to live outside the university, but allow startups and corporates uh, to have space there with wet lab and core facilities, greenhouse space, urban farming space, kitchen and food processing. We're working on a 20,000 liter biomanufacturing uh, space there too, um, as well. A couple just key takeaways, then I'll stop. Uh, California is that global climate smart agri-food innovation leader to so want to keep um, playing that role to help pave the way for the future and enable solutions that will work all over the world. Uh, we really believe that public private sector collaboration is the key, and that's what we're doing from the university. And our program, you see in our vine, we can really help startups yeah, and corporate technologies de-risk their investments through our program and our networks. We'd love to talk to you. And so connect with me anytime afterwards. I'll be here to you. All right, we have time for... Um, oh. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. We have time for two quick questions. Okay. Thank uh, very thank you. So, uh, one question you, you spoke about shifting uh, ideas cross value and like when, when you go from uh, the very small projects which are not to cost scale to how you commercialize and have an understanding of the have, but these ideas come to commercialization. And uh, the way you present it, it's, it's expensive, or maybe not. Maybe, how do you look at it? Do you, is, is this a costly proposition, or is there any profit to be made? And if it's not profit, then how do you measure success for what you're doing, and who pays for that success? Yeah, so I mean, we're, we're interested in technologies that have a business model. And so uh, we have several different ways um, to evaluate that. Um, First, we're, we have a, a techno-economic analysis that we do an analysis on various technologies that we're, we're considering working with. And 
So we, we try to look for a potential business model, but at the same time, we don't want to pick winners and losers, but at least for look for, uh, is there a customer out there? Um, is there a business model that will fit in there? And then several programs we have. I mean, our navigator, we can just simply make connections. We also have a, a, a non-equity studio program, which is rather expensive, where we um, invite companies to participate in uh, very um, heavy-handed tech development where we move them from technology to company, and we support them through a variety of mentorship, um, funding, uh, testing, tech development, like a whole bunch of stuff. We don't take equity for that. We're funding that activity through grants today. Um, and so we do help companies that way. It is very expensive to do, we can only help a small number of companies. We also have a non-equity accelerator where we actually take a larger number of companies and test and evaluate those. We don't take equity again, but we also um, help um, them across the category. So uh, we try to focus on things that have market potential. We do have a program to support them and it is fairly expensive to do it, um, but we also try to scale it up as well by working with cohorts of companies. How, how is this being funded if you're not taking anything in any of these companies? Right now, we're primarily funding this activity through government funding, state California and federal government funding. We will be, over time, probably working to transition to more private philanthropic and uh, like equity other-based sources, but um, we're trying to take a very slow, calculated approach to that. Um, and, and work and partner with funds and other approaches rather than doing that ourselves um, where we don't have the know how. Well, um, this is a uh, hard question to uh, consider. Um, from what we know about that culture is the most demanding resource activity humans have and uh, it's the most contaminated one and so on and so forth. So do you envision a future near by a close by a future where humanity won't need agriculture for food? that instead of feeding us will be used for restoring nature, its uh, richness and things like that? Or is that something that is out of the picture? Um, I personally don't envision a nearby future where we won't be using agriculture for food supply. Um, I do think that you know the food technology space is pointing the way towards uh, a new future that is perhaps more sustainable um, and uses less resources and uses them more efficiently, but I don't think it's nearby. Um, I think, you know, the initial hype with the alternative protein and plant protein sector, um, you know, that's sort of where, where I think, as you probably know, we're at the trough of dis disillusionment there. There is a future there, certainly. And it's, we're glad to have those companies that tell a point the way. But the food system is so embedded in not just giving us caloric sustenance, but in our culture, in how we live our life. And so, you know, to replace the, the food we produce and how we prepare it and how we eat it, community and families, into a tank that produces, let's call it soil and grain whatever comes out the other end. Um, I, I just don't see it happening. I see us replacing pieces along the way, and I see us creating new products that point the way, but I just don't see that being the replacement for agriculture anytime soon. So we have to continue to work on making agriculture more sustainable, more efficient, um, more circular, while we're inventing the future of food at the same time. That's all the time. Oh, one more question. Okay. Uh, talking about the theory, about the new technology and, and what is coming up, I, I, I saw in the news that in Netherlands there is a mandatory to reduce the population of the cows. It's just a theory that it's going to be improving the, the, the ecology and it, it's, it 
What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, I, so I, I was there actually last year on the day that that announcement came out. Um, for those of you who don't know what, what we're talking about here, the Netherlands basically created a nitrogen reduction policy in support of climate, climate change mitigation in the EU by taking out, say, 30% of farms or something like that in the Netherlands. And um, by the way, in the Netherlands, a tiny little country that is the second largest exporter of food in the world, that's a big deal. So, um, you know, they, they took a very heavy-handed approach. Um, you know, you might have seen farmers, you know, driving their tractors through the streets and rioting and protesting. Uh, my personal opinion is that it, it, was, it was a little bit too fast, a little bit too much, too soon. Other countries around the Netherlands, like Denmark, have taken a much more even-handed approach, even though they're moving in the same direction. But it's an interesting question. Um, you know, if we, if we take production, take Netherlands out of production, and we stop producing food for the rest of the world, where does that food production go? Because the demand doesn't dry up. And so now we've, we've gone to other places um, around Europe that don't have as high a standard as the Netherlands, and we've just kicked the can down the road. So I, I don't feel like, uh, I feel like it was a knee-jerk reaction. It started a good conversation. It's probably not going to be implemented as designed because it's too hard of a change too fast, but it is pointing the way to where governments are going in terms of how they're thinking about addressing climate change through reducing um, ag productivity. All right. Thank you, Gabriel, and thank you to everyone who participated in a fantastic first day at SDLC's annual summit.